Next speaker is Brett Denovi, who I'm very, very proud to introduce. Uh, Brett is in the intellectual grandson of B.F. Skinner. Did his graduate work at West Virginia University uh, with uh, Julie Vargas, who was uh, Skinner's daughter. He is the CEO of Brett Denovi and Associates, uh, based in South Jersey. One of the largest, if not largest, human services companies in the entire East Coast. They've won multiple awards for how well they treat their employees. They've been one of the best places to work in New Jersey, and they've won some other awards. They do their work with great skill and with great appreciation for the science. And Brett wanted me to remind you that he is a hands-on-the-ground, let's-get-it-done practitioner who day in, day out is running a large human service organization that delivers the, the kind of education, care, and services to our most vulnerable clients that they deserve. So I'm very proud here to welcome Brett Denovi. All right, it works. Welcome. Uh, I have to be honest with you and very transparent. Initially, when I got an invite from the convention email address, I thought I was being invited by accident because I looked at the rock stars that were in this lineup, and I tell you, I'm quite humbled. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually very excited to be here. I just can see the energy in the room. I can feel it, and I just, uh, I'm really excited. So what we're gonna talk about today are six key factors to, how scare, to scale an organization with quality. So we've been through quite some change over the past 13 years. Started off with three employees, now we have over 350 employees. As a result of that, it, it means that uh, when you add up the hours worked uh, all throughout the East Coast, mostly New Jersey, New York, Eastern Pennsylvania, and Delaware, we, we did a little analysis and determined that there, last year we worked 362,510 hours. Now, by just throwing those numbers out there, you can imagine with that number of hours, there's going to be quality challenges. But I can tell you the, the moment we see any pattern of quality challenges is when we will stop growing. And everyone knows that within the company. So what I really uh, pride myself in in this talk today is just about the daily grind, implementing behavior analytic procedures, performance management, and OBM, day-to-day, -day, uh, having it run through the fabric of everything we do. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not a very fancy author. I have some publications, very few. Um, I'm not a, a professor, although I've taught some adjunct courses. And as a result of that, I feel there's some things that have helped me uh, just get down to the bottom line, and, and what I enjoy more than anything is just immerse, did the immersion into the day-to-day -day grind, 16 hours a day, loving it, with all those employees and just looking at problems, because every time there's a problem is the time I get excited, because a problem means an opportunity for change and improvement. So as a result of uh, the 13 years that we've been in business and the 27 years I've been in the field, growth is important, but like I said, the moment that quality is impacted, we will scale down, and everyone's aware of that. And being a premium service is something that we take a lot of pride in. And as a result, my talk is just simply about six key factors that help you scale your organization with quality. So the size of the organization is really irrelevant. It's the quality and delivery of the services. Had a, I did a little talk with uh, Dr. John Bailey a couple weeks ago, and he talked about his title was subtle hidden contingencies that can occur with an organization that grows at this size. And it, was, it resonated with me because of, we're, our leadership is extremely careful as a result. So I, I identified six key factors. I didn't just make them up. These are, for the most part, all determined in the empirical literature. 
But the first one's talked about very little, which is branding. I like how Dr. Weatherly and I like how a lot of folks here already talked about culture. We're gonna talk about that a little more today. Culture and what makes you stand out as an organization in order to scale effectively. Uh, Dr. McGee talked a little about employee selection mechanisms. She asked by a show of hands how many people do have a department for rigorous interviewing, selection, and screening. Can you raise your hands again if you have a department that does the hiring? That's awesome. And then the third thing one of those speakers talked about was goal setting. Goal setting can't just be, you know, we, you know, we're doing a good job. Try hard. Measurable, specific goals. And then the fourth area to scale your factor, fact, your organization with quality would be the type of rigorous feedback, reciprocal coaching that's needed day to day. Not annually, not monthly, not the annual performance evaluation that everyone hates because it's ineffective, but day to day reciprocal feedback. And self monitoring and reinforcement and performance based pay. Let's talk a little bit about factor number one in scaling your organization branding. So, what is it that makes an organization successful? One, an organization or an agency needs to stand out in a positive way. And one of, there's, a, there's a TED Talk. Raise your hand if you ever watch TED Talks. Ah, oh, don't you love them? It's amazing what they can get done in 18 minutes. But there's, no, there's a, have you ever heard of Simon Sinek? Raise your hand. Got one of the most viewed TED Talks ever in the, in the history of TED Talks in the world. Simon Sinek, Simon Sinek talks about one key factor that I'm not necessarily saying is, is illustrated in, in the OBM literature, but there's something to it and it needs to be studied because it's about culture. Organizations that are successful know why they do what they do. Knowing why you do what you do. Because it's not about the product that you deliver, the service you deliver. People want to know why you're doing it. Are you authentic? Are you genuine in, in, your, in what you're delivering? And some of the, the best companies in the world, like Google, let me, let, let's look at their, their why is critical. So your vision and your mission statement should explain why you're doing what you're doing. Are you passionate and authentic? Organizing the world's information to make it universally acceptable. Uh, accessible. That's Google. Huge. Apple. Make a contribution to the world by making tools for the mind that advance humankind. Hum, humankind. That's an incredibly lofty goal. Let's look at Facebook and our friend Zuck. I don't know Zuck. It sounded like I did. <laughs> Zuck. Uh, Facebook, giving the power to share and make the world more open and connected. That's really a lofty goal, and they're doing it. It's amazing. Successful companies know why they're doing what they're doing, and they have a clear, clear vision. Let's look at Jeff Bezos, Amazon. They want to be the Earth's most customer-centric company, and they sure are. Ever, who here has ever ordered on Amazon? Amazon Prime. Don't you love the two-day shipping? I love it. Except I end up spending a little more than I expected, because what's customer-centric about it? Well, you end up, after you make a purchase, your previous purchases and your histories come up, and stimuli that have previously been reinforced through purchases and use pop up. It's amazing. We need to get there with a behavior analysis. And we're going to talk a little bit about social media today and how behavior analysts can impact it responsibly. So we spent a lot of time in, at, at BDA, we'll call it BDA, uh, with the 300 and some people. We all, I think everyone can articulate, articulate this. Now it sounds a little bit large and, and grandiose, but we're, and we're far from it, and we're quite humbled that we're far from it, but our goal as an agency, and I think your agency, who here is a leader in their agency? Raise your hand, your organization. Who here is actually an owner or a stakeholder? Uh, okay, great. So all I'm suggesting is that you make your vision grand. So ours is expanding the world's collective wisdom of behavior analysis. And we want to use the science to, to change the landscape of industry, education, and society at large. It's, it's something that we're passionate about. And when people come in my office, 
we drilled to a level of fluency. My mentor, Dr. Julie Vargas, was big on fluency. She would drill me, and now when, when leaders in our company come in, there's things that we drill, and that's one of them. And, and every day, we ask them, what are you doing to move forward? Who thinks we could have a behavior analytic principles change the fabric of government? Raise your hand. All right, cool. Anybody miss Obama? I really miss him. <laughs> so along with branding, you need to have a unique, authentic, and like I said, genuine mission. And you need to stand out, just like the little yellow umbrella that it stood out. Well, you know, figure out what makes your organization different. For us, we're similar, as, as Dr. Hantula said, it's just making sure that, look, we're, the people in our agency, we are geeks. We love the behavior analytic research. Enough that Dr. Julie Vargas sent me her father's audio tapes that have never been uh, published. And we literally sit there, a group of us sit there and listen to, to talks of B.F. Skinner's uh, interviews, and we're writing them down, and we're trying to translate them into a future book. So, so just love what you do and be authentic with it, and then let that be one of your driving factors. So the second thing with organizations is you have to, in addition to knowing why you do what you do, you need to be very authentic in what you do. So we're very clear when someone is looking for a service and when someone's interviewing or any stakeholder that we are not a broad stroke of services. Uh, many behavior analytic agencies are a broad stroke, and there's nothing wrong with that. OT, speech, uh, physical therapy, and ABA. Someone earlier said, yeah, we, we do ABA between 3.02 p.m. and 3.06. Now, ABA runs through the fabric of what's done every minute of every day. We bleed ABA out of our eyes. That's kind of weird, sorry. <laughs> I get excited, as you can tell. So being the opposite of a broad stroke service, it's very important to, let, to, to make that very clear at the outset with your stakeholders. Let your employees, let your, let your, your potential customers know. If you want to do cognitive therapy, nothing wrong with it. We're interdisciplinary. We work with all, we embrace all disciplines. If you want to do occupational therapy, you want to do Freudian stuff, it's not us. And be very clear. Be upfront. Because that's how you're sure to select your clients and make a selective match between your skill set and what they're looking for. So being that we're an opposite of a broad stroke, I just, if you will, I want you to think of your organization as what exactly are you? And for us, it's being laser focused on behavior analytic principles only. So although we're laser focused, what's cool is just the, the excitement of, of what the people in the room today all realize that those principles are they, they go far, they're, they're far reaching. So the applications are very broad. We already talked about today, safety, general education, uh, industry, general uh, special education, young learners with autism. And it's kind of a shame, I think, that the behavior analysis is, and performance management or the ABA principles are, seem to be pigeonholed with autism. And don't get me wrong, I live and breathe it. I suddenly became a parent of a stepchild with autism, and I got immersed in it really quickly, day and night. So along with branding, it's important that when you're determining your culture and your, your authenticity as an agency, that you sometimes, in order to forage and find new paths and, and stand out from the rest, to be that yellow umbrella, you have to push the envelope. Now, this is weird, but I want to explain. We don't ride around in this like the executives. What we did, we had to push the envelope and be prepared for some failure, calculated failure. For us, I know my fiance who's sitting there, she almost had a heart attack when our agency bought a bunch of stretch limos. We needed, we needed to determine how can we take the next step and genuinely help learners with developmental disabilities in a safer way. So how could we... Uh, make sure that the, uh, 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 we work with the most severe population. How can we prevent the driver from being at risk? Raise your hand if you've ever uh, 
been involved or supervised someone that had to transport an individual with severe behaviors and the drivers at risk. All right? So we, we said, hey, let's get a stretch on enough. I don't know why everyone doesn't do that. The good thing is, because of Uber, they're really cheap. So pushing the envelope is very important for an agency when it's part of its culture and its branding. Google, Apple, Amazon, they push the envelopes. We make errors. Look, we have neighbors we have that really we get along great with. Then we have a couple of neighbors that call the police every day because of the limos. So you're going to have failures, but it's important when you're uh, implementing OBM strategies to, to scale an agency. So what's even more important when it comes to being unique and authentic in your brand is making sure that you keep your employees and your learners first if you're serving in human services. And for us, that's dignity. One of the reasons we wanted to do this is we wanted to show that, you know, it's not every learner has to be in the small yellow school bus. What resonated with me, and it just touched my heart tremendously, was there, there was a mother that came up to me at a trampoline park in New Jersey, and she said to me, because uh, there were kids jumping all over, there was a limo sitting outside, and she said to me, you know, Mr. Denovi, I just want to introduce myself, and I want to let you know that my child and I have been treated like the black sheep in our neighborhood. And we, for years now, my son would strip down naked, run out of his house or elopement, knock on neighbor's doors, and police were called frequently. It's a little, a little kid that didn't have a functional equivalent and needed a behavior plan. She said she felt like the, ja the black sheep in the neighborhood. What, what made it all worth it for me is this mother came down and she, she introduced me and she, she told me, you know what, Mr. Denovi, I uh, I, I had your, your stretch limo pulled up. I like the safety aspect because there were multiple staff in case there's severe behavior. And Mr. Steve, the driver, opened, he didn't have a white glove. That's pretty cool though. I, I put that for effect. Opened the door and I was walking out to the car and all my neighbors were looking at me that don't like me. And I looked at them, I smiled. And me and my son entered into the limo. She said, and I felt this sense of dignity. And that's the stuff that makes it real for me. That made it exciting to me. Now, it's a losing financial problem. I mean, these things require correction all the time and, and being fixed. They're not made for this sort of thing, especially the beating that they take. Um, but it's important. What I want to suggest to you today is that even if you have a for-profit agency, run it like a nonprofit. Take the smallest amount of margin that you can and expect that some departments will lose money because it's part of a pipeline that builds your brand and then lets people know what you, what you care about, which is the learners first. Number three when it comes to branding is the organizational culture. So I sat there and I thought about it. I'm like, how is it that people, you know, Harley Davidson, I, I'm not a Harley rider, but I, I admire the brand. How is it that people that are Harley Davidson riders are actually going to take a motorcycle and tattoo it to their arm? That's culture. Does that make sense? It's culture that someone's going to tattoo them to their arm. And they have a big vision, fulfilling dreams of personal freedom, the open road. It's a culture. This is what gets your organization recognized. You don't see these companies without any soul. You don't see people taking some arbitrary product and tattooing like Windex on their back? <laughs> For real. That's weird, isn't it? So companies that are forward thinking, that, that push the envelope, one of them's Google. It's actually turned into a verb. I hear people saying, let's Google it. That's when your, your, your company is going to go to the next level by building the culture and the brand when you can be a verb. <laughs> I don't know if we'll ever be there. Googling it. So when you think about it, the word Google, there's actually people just like we're calling ourselves OBMers. It's pretty exciting. People that work there call themselves Googlers. That's a passionate culture. You don't see people with companies that have no soul, no heart, and no, nothing, no vision of why. You don't see them saying, let's go Kmart it. 
actually was ranked, I hope I don't get in trouble by Kmart, but it was ranked one of the lowest uh, engagement agencies or companies. So let's talk about strategy. So we, today, today I, what I love today is there's a lot of theory discussed, but what I, what I would suggest today is that we break it down and actually give, I want to give you some concrete suggestions that have demonstrated efficacy with our agency and with other agencies that we build. So culture. The word culture. What are ways that you can create culture? What are actionable items that you can engage in to create culture, which is a very subjective thing? Well, the first one is, what do people care about more than anything? Their own family. If your agency recognizes that the family members of the employees come first, that is culture. So every single person that comes in for an interview with our agency they're told that if something's going down with a client you're working with, but your family needs you in an emergency, as long as that kid's safe, you're expected to stop what you're doing and help your family because it's like that. Who took an airplane here today? Yep, it's like that, it's like that philosophy where you put your oxygen mask on first before you can help another. You're not going to be effective. Your employees will not be effective with other people's families unless their family is tight at home. Follow me, because that, if things aren't right at home, for me, family's the bedrock, it's the foundation, it's my oxygen that gives me the ability to help other families. And I, I, many, fa many professionals are the same way. I was just thinking, Dr. Wesley said his daughter's in uh, Disney. I'm sure he'd, he would love to be with her, um, but that's, that's an example of family. So culture, what else when it comes to culture? How do you build culture? Look, who here works in an, a, an organization that's like consulting and you're spread out over many areas? Raise your hand if you do consulting and your people. Okay, about a third of you raise your hand. So one of the biggest challenges was with a consulting, a behavior analytic consulting agency is that people are all over the place. How do you build any kind of connection? Well, we have the same exact problem all throughout the East Coast. We, we ran into situations where we needed to figure out how can people, you know, people were sending text messages and emails and then there was no one behind it. It's a lot harder to tell somebody something they don't want to hear or, or something challenging if you just do it face to face and you agree. So what, we, what we've done is we started creating our own venues and there's already stuff out there. You can create virtual venues to connect your people, especially if you're spread out. One of them? Facebook, a closed Facebook. What we started doing is creating these, these various groups. You have to watch them. People sign a, a form explaining them of the policy that how they should conduct themselves on social media, because you can imagine that can go south quickly. But a, an administrator in the agency can approve what's posted. But it, it's the most amazing thing. I see people with having babies and they're posting it, and they're congratulating each other. People are saying their birthdays, and people that never met each other in Manhattan are talking to people in Cape May, New Jersey, and in Delaware, and, they, and it feels like they know each other already. In addition to virtual venues, what's another strategy to build culture? Physical venues. So these are actually real pictures. Uh, the one on the left is so cool to me because it was a little dance that we had at, in our office, and the employees all came together, and the kids, and the parents watched from across the way. And what we noticed is that the employees connected on a level because they were all so far apart. We paid for hotels for them to be able to connect face to face. And then afterwards, they had a little dance afterwards. So that was, that was a, a way for them to connect. So sometimes not just virtual venues, you need physical venues. Number four, branding, measurement. So, there's Obama, I missed him. I don't miss Bieber. So, let's talk now specifics. How do you, how do you take, we're behavior analysts and we, we look hard at data. Data drives our decisions. It's not meant to just take data and do nothing with it, but there's awesome data being collected every day. I would not say I'm any kind of social media expert. However, I study it because I realize that there are permanent products left day to day and they're like, leading and lagging measures that can be looked at to help build your culture and your brand. And 
One of them is you can just, it's a free thing. You can take your organization, type it in or your name into uh, the cloud, um, just write cloud score, type it into Google, and then you can find out on a number of one to 100 how much influence do you have in the community that you're trying to, to brand. Here's another one. Raise your hand if you're on LinkedIn. Oh, that's awesome, isn't it? I think uh, Jeff Wiener, uh, the CEO, is, is brilliant. There's, you may not know this, and for some reason it'll advertise this, but you can come up with one number that's, that's data-based, empirically driven, that helps you determine on LinkedIn your, your influence, which is called the social ceiling index. Social ceiling index. It's great, it measures your brand awareness, finding the right people, engaging with insights, and building relationships. So think about it. Another one, Google Analytics. Most people are familiar with this. Find out your, your, you know, your website, what's important and what you're trying to brand and what you're trying to show the world, or even just your local community. Find out where the traffic's coming from. And one, one of the ways to do that is through Alexa. And I don't mean the Alexa that talks and all that. My daughter has one, I have no idea. <laughs> it wakes her up. Is anyone familiar with this Alexa thing? This is interesting because this is a different, it's a free site. You type in your website and it tells you where the traffic's coming from. Look, we're behavior analysts. We need to study the, where the traffic come from, comes from and learn how to respond to that actively. We should be reinforcing the people that drive business to our sites. Let's reinforce that performance as long as it's appropriate. So this is just one of ours. It, uh, it also tells you the global rank. YouTube comes up two, Facebook's three, uh, LinkedIn is 18. But these are some of the areas that drive stuff to our, our site. Branding strategy number five, familiarity. This one I don't necessarily have OBM research to suggest. I think it would be great if the field looked into this, but people want to be familiar with the product or service. So not only do they want to know why you do what you do, but they want to see consistency. So has anyone, has anyone ever uh, gone away and you just want to know that that same 7-Eleven or Wawa, or you just want that same quality product while well, I'm that way when it comes to Ritz-Carlton? So, I know that if my fiance and I are gonna go take a trip, we know we can't always afford it, but we know we're gonna get the same level of service. Because there's nothing worse than your brand and your culture that's put out there to be unpredictable and get different levels of service. So people want familiar familiarity. They don't want unpredictability. Do you ever go to a hotel and you don't know what you're gonna get on the website, it looks one way, and then all of a sudden it looks like this. A little bit like Bates Motel, isn't it? Raise your hand if you watch Bates Motel. <laughs> Select, let's look at key factor number two in scaling your business. And I believe Dr. McGee mentioned this, which is select selection. Very rigorous mining and uh, a lot of active responding, your selection mechanism for hiring people that fit your culture, that care. And the way I see it is a selection mechanism for hiring. And I, I'll tell you one thing, there's not one thing I'm suggesting up here that we're not doing 16 hours a day. And one of them is, it's sort of like, I think of the selection mechanism like, a, like almost like a strainer. And, uh, you're trying to find the gold nugget within there and you're straining through it. And one of the ways that we found to, to identify who might be a great fit for the your organization's values, mission, and, and your, your, your service is to use an interview survey and it's like a, finding a diamond in the rough because using a pre-interview survey, what we're doing is we've identified all the key factors that drive our culture in order to determine if they'll be a good fit. Consequently, we're fortunate, I hope I don't jinx myself, but our turnover is 2.8% in human services, 2.8%. So over 
retention. And one of those reasons, I think, is because right at the gate, the, the, the selection process occurs. It's intense. Um, so some of the questions are, like Aubrey Daniels talks about pay for performance. One of the critical factors in identifying people for your agency that are going to fulfill your brand and mission, and if, if they're going to work for pay for performance, we ask questions in our survey. So before they get in the door, are they going to want a steady salary, or do they want the potential for high pay? We like to see the people that want to work hard and, and engage in what I like to call a free operant earning and learning environment. We ask questions like this to determine if, this, if behavior analysis is the right field for them. Do they want to? We ask a simple question, and there's only about 10 questions on the pre-interview survey. Before they come into our door to interview with us, we want to know if they're interested in the science of human behavior, or they want to sit on a, sit on a couch and counsel. We do intel. We do almost like a reconnaissance. There's ways you can, again, your turnover rate could be low to none if you're figuring out this culture from the get-go. One of them is the use of Facebook. Now, there are some laws around this. You can't ask people for their password. You, you can review their public settings. However, you, you can't ask certain questions about what was posted. We look at their LinkedIn profile. And the second thing in employee selection is the actual interview. What we found is that putting people in small panels, seeing how they interact socially, because think about it, what we do day to day in human services is the, the soft skills. I mean, let me ask you this. How many people in here know awesome behavior analysts that have poor social skills? <laughs> oh my goodness, everyone's raised their hand. The panel interview. We literally, we're actually compiling all this data. We're going we're gonna to compare it to when we didn't do this and identify, look, it's really interesting when people are in a panel. Do they interrupt each other? Do they engage in pro-social behaviors? Do they help each other? Do they make eye contact? Do they monopolize the conversation? All these things really help you determine, do they fit your brand? Do they have soft skills? The other thing is when you're doing your selection and your selection mechanism, you want to find out, you want to make sure you don't give the answers away in the beginning. Very open-ended questions. So you're not talking about the job. All you're doing in the beginning of the, in our selection panels, we interview about 30 people a week. We hire one out of every 14.2, we figured it out, of those third, of the people that come in the door. And one of the, one of the selection mechanisms that we use is during the interview, we don't talk about the job. We ask them to tell us what they want. Because what happens is when you talk about the job, people start to actively respond to tell you what they think you want to hear. So after the interview is a whole other step in the process. Employee selection can be further accomplished, and you can vet out more, step, more people that fit your vision, and is by giving them some sort of follow-up assignment. Because everyone knows the people that, are, the human service workers that are really great with kids, they're good, they may have good social skills and soft skills, however, they can't even enter their timesheet and, <laughs> and it's a simple paperwork matter. So we create, we engineer situations where after the interview, the people have to go onto a YouTube channel, watch any of the hundred and some behavior analytic videos that we post from different speakers, tell us what they think their niche might be, what are they interested in, and then they have to send an email with follow-up. What we find, some people will respond immediately within 24 hours, and they, and they engage in discretionary effort. Because we say, just look at six videos. Tell us what might be your niche. Some people do like 10, 15. Wow, there's someone with discretionary effort. Again, it's part of the strainer, cream from the crop. And then after the hire, we let people know the first 30, 60, 90 days, it's still the interview. We see it as natural selection. Uh, so in the first 30 days, it's almost like boot camp. So natural selection and those that are performing at high levels continue to separate themselves from those who don't. We have the love, we're fortunate that we can be this picky, and that's because of the culture that was built previously. We can't, it's something that takes time. You, you're probably saying to yourself, we can't be that picky for direct staff right now. However, if you have such a low profit margin and you run, we're, we're a for-profit agency, if we run like a 
prof, uh, a nonprofit agency and take no margin or very minimal and keep reinvesting, those, those folks are going to be paid higher and they deserve it. Because they're dealing with people's most precious kids, best, most precious assets, which are their kids. Number three, strategy number three. I number these things specifically because if I suck, you know how long I'm going to suck. So I just want you to know this is why they're numbered because every once in a while I don't do so well. Goal setting. Number three, employee goal setting. And this was brought up by one of the previous uh, speakers. Goal setting having to be specific. Goal setting has to occur at three levels. And again, I'm not making this stuff up. This is driven in empirical literature. Goal setting, let's look at it. Key performance indicators have to be determined at the individual, the departmental, and the organization-wide level. One of the biggest challenges anecdotally that I see is that people try to set goals professionally and personally, and they set a million of them. And all of a sudden, it's like paralysis through analysis. Common concern. Too many goals. Identify your, like Dr. Weatherly says, pinpoint. Identify the smallest behavior change that has the biggest impact and use those one, two, or three goals. So when you have too many things that you're trying to chase as an employee or as, as a leader, you're like this, a deer in the headlights. Ever have that feeling? I felt like that, that way this morning when I walked in the room. I'm like, I have to talk to these people? <laughs> That's how I felt. So when it comes to a strategy under goal setting, one of the best things to do, okay, there isn't, this is anecdotal. I don't have research to support this. I want to tell you what is and isn't. But most people, what they want is they, in their job where they, where they have longevity, they want to do something they're good at. It's like they want to feel appreciated and they want to make an impact on people's lives. And right in the middle is sort of what we call, we find their niche. So all 350 some people, their weekly mentoring meeting is figuring out how they can move closer to their niche. Because we care about them, not just the output for the agency. What's their long-term niche? And granted, 99% of their job initially may not be in their area of interest, but the other, the 1% is so darn exciting that it's their oxygen, that they would do it for free. That, that produces low, high retention rates. Customize. Whoops, there's a deer again. Customize it. And, I, and this is pretty clear. People want to find their niche, and they also need to know, if you look at a Gallup poll in 2008, 35% of employees are satisfied with their chances of, only 35% are satisfied with their chances of promotion. That's concerning. And some of the research suggests that they don't feel, they don't understand how the, the direct service worker feels like they're a cog in the wheel and they don't know where they connect to the bigger picture. Did you ever, did you ever uh, have a direct implementation staff that says they're having a rough day and they're not sure if the, the learner is any further along than they were? However, after you show them a graph over time, and it shows how it contributes to the big picture and it was a trend, they're relieved. That's kind of like what has to happen day to day. What does the direct implementation worker do that contributes to the big picture? So how did they contribute? And once they do contribute, how can it be tied to some financial reinforcement? And it needs to be measurable. So the individual goals, need to be concrete. Uh, we need to find ways, creative ways that I'm meeting them, and we don't want to compare people against others. There's nothing worse than uh, someone comparing an employee against another, your whole bell-shaped curve. You know, my mentor, Julie, used to always say, it's, it's you beating your previous performance, and that's what matters. So an example, the perfect example, again, today when I talked about practical implementation, and a perfect example is, there's a guy in our company named Mark. He came in a year and a half ago. He's a certified fitness trainer. It took him a year and a half till we found the opportunity, but suddenly he started creating his own little group and his own Facebook group, which was a subgroup of our, of our agency, which was Movement Matters. All of a sudden now, there's private pay using the science of behavior analysis for fitness. This guy found his niche. I don't want to jink myself, but I don't think he's going to go anywhere for a long time. He found his niche. So making his goals 
measurable or important. So a sample, some sample individuals could be, you know, getting a registered behavior te technician within 100 days, uh, receiving, you know, this is a soft measure, but ratings, you know, an average rating on Google, Facebook. Now, when it comes to making goals measurable, so one of the previous speakers talked about making it measurable. What we find is that whether it's quality or whether it's revenue, whatever the, whatever the key performance indicators that you identify that's responsible for success, setting small, changing criterion goals. And the progress can be, can produce peak performance. It's amazing. And it's amazing what people do when they, they work together as a group. You define the outcome and they get creative with how to get there. So what we find too, in order to create high levels of steady responding, after creating the changing criterion goal, because you have a changing criterion goal, then you have a post-reinforcement pause, let's, let's shift it to an overall percentage of revenue. To this day, I still can't understand how any agency, a nonprofit or for-profit organization, can have uh, one business owner or one CEO making the profit. It's got to be disseminated and spread throughout the organization at every level. Just listed, I'm not going to bore you with all these, I just listed some sample organizational-wide goals, you know, some key performance indicators to help, that help us determine if, if we're successful could be the publication, we're really falling short on that, diversity in funding, because you, there's nothing worse than not having diversity in your funding stream, because I, I'll give you an example of that, I had a superintendent, 13 years when we started this company, a superintendent called me in their office, and said, so don't forget, Mr. Genovi, we pay you. This is what you're going to say in the IEP. And you'll never have something similar to that? Hopefully not. Well, we lost that contract. <laughs> we weren't back next year. However, that same superintendent contacted me two years later and asked if we can do an independent evaluation for that kid's child. So determine the key performance indicators. Number four on the six strategies on how to scale your organization, which is simply feedback and coaching. Six minutes and 17 seconds. So one of the keys is how do you crunch all this data? So it's really cool now that um, you could, you know, how do you take all, the, all these data, like surveys, percentage of kids that, that, are, de that are sent to less restrictive settings, uh, profit loss, uh, soft measures, well, one of the, one of the things that's, that we're emerging is, is uh, creating algorithms. We ended up hiring a guy, his name's Ethan Scholes, that was a, a bank strategist. We have to reach outside of our field. This guy is a guy who saves TD Bank like 0.001 cents for millions of people and actually saves the, the, uh, the whole bank money. He came up with ways that you could automize, automate things. What are some things that are challenging for us as human service workers to automate? Uh, we call them our secret weapon. One of them is just being on pace to use your authorized hours. How many people here uh, serve insurance funded programs? Yeah, so this, those 15 minute intervals can be challenging, can't they? and to be able to track them. So when you have 300 and some people, as you scale, you need the infrastructure to track those things. So he looks at it all different ways. Every single Tuesday at 11, he's meeting with me and he's showing me which, these are, these are just examples of, uh, of a formula that was created that, that will help predict whether, he calls it breaching. Are they breaching over the authorized hours and we're gonna lose money? Or are they going under and we're not fulfilling that child's services? It's so cool. So what he did, it's hard to explain this in four and a half minutes, but to make it quick, he basically takes over time the y-axis there that goes upward. At the end, the, the little orange bar on the right, that's, at, that's when they're at 100% that their whole utilization has been used. The whole 90-day off has been used for, three, for hundreds of kids, right? Anyone who gets close to what we call the sweet spot, so they were able to, these are, this is staff performance. If they get close to the 100%, which is on the left axis, that means they fully utilize their hours and the closer, the closer they can come. He, he, he does a VR schedule. He spins a wheel. 
and, and it's a VR schedule. So the people get close to the 100% utilization, they fulfilled their service for that learner, and they earn financial reinforcement. Stop annual performance reviews. That's the, the strategy. I mean, obviously, Dr. Dr. Aubrey Daniels talks about this. Look at all the principles that they violate. Not immediate, not frequent, not small amounts. Sometimes the manager just remembers what they did in the past you know, 30 days, and then they end up basing it on that. What, what has to be done is replacing it with the frequent reciprocal feedback. So what we, what we started doing is real, and you guys have already, the previous speakers talked about this, you can't have an annual review. Frequent feedback, it creates an opportunity for, to have genuine dialogue. So we created this 30 second survey. There's lots of ways you can do it. Survey Monkey is one of them. It's kind of neat. So at a, at a touch of a button, so the employees have an app, they go on their phone, they click their satisfaction, then they click whether or not they've been mentored. Have they been receiving enough support? And have they also given mentoring? So at a click, click of a button, you can determine the overall temperature of your whole organization. Pretty cool. So that they're easy to do. Nothing here I'm talking about is proprietary. SurveyMonkey does it. Google Forms is another way to do it. Coaching and feedback. So the fifth factor for effective coaching and feedback is face-to-face -face meetings rather than text. We talked about that. It's concerning when, you're, when people are disconnected, especially that are consultants over time. Coaching and feedback requires often face-to-face -face interaction, even if you're using Google Hangouts. And factor number six in coaching and feedback, do not have, don't stack your organization. I can't tell you how many organizations I see over all the years I've been practicing behavior analysis, and it would be MIC organizations Every six years, they hire their friends. There's an assistant director, a director, a vice president. And then the people on the front line are totally disconnected, or the people on the, t on the executive levels are disconnected from what they need on the front line. Flatten your organization. Pay your front staff the most. I think Mark Cuban once said that uh, bureaucracies were created, and, and these types of layers are created to compensate for what managers think are inadequacies. Pay your staff highly. Cut out the levels. Increase the communication and trust them. And do not micromanage the staff. There's nothing worse than a smart individual being micromanaged. Who here has been micromanaged before? Didn't you want to quit? You couldn't be creative. And number five, self-monitoring. Self-monitoring can be broken into, we tried to come up with a, uh, a definition of self-monitoring, which is really, from behavioral terms, daily actions that forego small and immediate reinforcers to access larger ones. And all, you know, all that is is simply the pre-MAC principle. So working with your, coaching your employees to be productive, especially when they have to be autonomous, which is important, using low probability tasks initially, and then getting momentum, and reporting out th this information. I see I'm running to like 30 seconds, so I'm, gonna, I'm still gonna touch on these. Have your individuals meet, have the leaders of each department self-monitor their own data and departments and report it out, and show Show the team so that the team, so literally this is what occurs every Monday. We're sitting around the table looking at each person's data and we're determining what actions need to take to meet the next thing. So I just wanted to tell you self-monitoring is so crucial. It's so crucial that as, as consultants, we have to manage our own time. And when I, when I was preparing for today, this is what I pictured. I pictured having small fixed intervals that I would prepare, but in reality, this is what happened. I prepared up the last hour. I was on the plane last night. So I, I find myself procrastinating and doing things I typically wouldn't do. The way, to, the way to have your employees produce peak performance and efficiency is through frequent small deadlines and, and report outs. And although we have, it produces a scallop effect, you'll have high rates of steady responding with the small report out dates. And that's what we do at the Monday meeting. And lastly, Pay for performance, Dr. Aubrey Daniels speaks high, a, a lot about this, which is, you know, how do you get people to work because they want to, not because they have to? And salary-based performance, basically, salary-based pay just reinforces, it doesn't pass a dead man's test. And I love how he talks about that because it's not immediate, it's not contingent, it's not frequent. Look at the typical, think about it, a human service worker, in some ways, they're just trying to pass time and think of a security guard. 
security guard stands there and has to watch a monitor, they're going to fall asleep. It doesn't pass the dead man's test. So some of the most mundane jobs in our administrative offices, we embed errors on purpose within the billing, and they get $100 each time they catch it. Keeps them on their toes, intermittent reinforcement. So I think of self-monitoring and efficient performance at work is similar to effective sleep. It's not the amount of time that you're in bed that matters, right? It's the amount of time that you're spent in REM. And that's the way it is in a performance environment. You don't want to pass time. You want to have paper performance. And share, sharing revenue is going to be key. So make the process. So to summarize, my last two slides, branding needs to be studied more in the organizational behavior management literature. Selection mechanisms, feedback, coaching, self-monitoring, reinforcement. So what I want to leave you with is what we talked about today, or it pushes the envelope, but I just want to leave you with the fact that what B.F. Skinner once said, which, which truly resonates with me, the way positive reinforcement is carried out is far more important than the amount. Ladies and gentlemen, you are a wonderful audience. Thanks.